When the president threatened to impose tariffs on Mexico for their failure to stop the migrants traveling through their country, the Democrats and many Republicans here literally went on fire. Typical is this statement by Nancy Pelosi. President Trump undermined America's preeminent leadership role in the world by recklessly threatening to impose tariffs on our close friend and neighbor to the South. Threats and temper tantrums are no way to negotiate foreign policy. End of quote. But a funny thing happened on the way to Armageddon. Even CNN admitted that President Trump got virtually everything it wanted. Listen to this. Moving forward, the president not going to impose those escalating tariffs on Mexico in exchange for those stepped up enforcement deals. Uh, the Mexican side also saying that they've encouraged the U.S. to step up aid to Central American countries where the migrants are coming from to improve conditions there, Victor and Christie. All right, Sarah Westwood, appreciate it so much. Thank you. So now there's the additional border enforcement and uh, help in breaking up trafficking networks. The U.S. got almost everything it wanted from Mexico. You know, the talks go on for another three months. The U.S. and Mexico continuing to focus on migrant crossings and asylum. And in a statement, the State Department confirmed that President Trump got virtually everything he wanted. Here's what the State Department said. Those migrants crossing the U.S. southern border to seek asylum will be rapidly returned to Mexico where they may await the adjudication of their U.S. asylum claims. In response, Mexico will authorize the entrance of all those individuals for humanitarian reasons in compliance with its international obligations while they await the adjudication of their asylum claims. Mexico will also offer jobs, health care, and education according to its principles. End of quote. More importantly, the president got a major concession the Mexican Congress will consider allowing asylum seekers to remain in Mexico while their cases are adjudicated. This is a big deal. This is a game changer. Even a former U.S. ambassador to Mexico says it is perfectly okay because Mexico is a safe country. I don't think CNN's Jim Shooter wanted to hear that. Listen to this. The, the U.S., I think, to make this work, does it not have to declare Mexico uh, and even Guatemala as safe countries, in other words, for these asylum seekers to be held in while they pursue their case, is that not uh, a tough argument to make in light of the violence and, and so on in both of those countries? I don't think it's that tough, Jim. Y yes, yeah. of course, there is violence in both of those countries. But Mexico, which is a country of, what, 120, 130 million people, mm -hmm. has 99% uh, of the population goes to work every day, goes to school every day. Uh, sure, they're aware of the violence. I don't think it would be that much of a stretch to say it's a safe country. This raises a very important question. When did it become racist to want to defend our borders? When did it become racist for American citizens to play a role in who gets into this country and what they bring and whether or not they benefit the country or hurt the country? Consider Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan was a congresswoman from Texas, happened to be black. She was part of a commission on immigration, and she recommended that we do something about employers who hire illegal aliens and that we make sure that our borders are secure. She also even had a problem with legal immigration and talked about the threat that unskilled illegal aliens pose to workers living in this country. Here's what she said in 1995. The Commission has concluded that a properly regula regulated system of legal immigration is in the national interest of the United States. The Commission recommends significant redefinition of priorities and reallocation of admission numbers to fulfill more effectively the objectives of our immigration system. Now, to be specific, the immigration recommends a tripartite immigration policy that permits the entry of nuclear family members, professional and skilled workers, and refugees. We propose core immigration levels of 550,000 per year. The commission emphasizes nuclear family. We recommend as a priority the closest family members, spouses and minor children of citizens of legal immigrants and parents of citizens are admitted as expeditiously as possible. I urge the Congress to adopt tough policies needed to verify employment authorization. 
What the Commission is concerned about are the unskilled workers in our society in an age in which unskilled workers have far too few opportunities open to them. When immigrants are less well-educated and less skilled, they may pose economic hardships for the most vulnerable of Americans, particularly those who are unemployed or underemployed. Finally, consider this 1991 letter that was co-signed by, among other people, Coretta Scott King. She was very concerned about the proposal in the Congress to loosen sanctions against employers who knowingly hire illegal aliens. She wrote a letter to Orrin Hatch, and in that letter, she and the other civil rights leaders said this. We are concerned, Senator Hatch, that your proposed remedy to the employer sanctions-based discrimination, namely the elimination of employer sanctions, will cause another problem the revival of the pre-1986 discrimination against black and brown U.S. and documented workers in favor of cheap labor, the undocumented workers. This would undoubtedly exacerbate an already severe economics crisis in communities where there are large numbers of new immigrants. Finally, we are concerned that some who support the repeal of employer sanctions are using discrimination as a guise for their desire to abuse undocumented workers and to introduce cheap labor into the U.S. workforce. America does not have a labor shortage. With roughly 7 million people unemployed and double that number discouraged from seeking work, the removal of employer sanctions threatens to add additional U.S. workers to the role of the unemployed. Additionally, it would add to competition for scarce jobs and drive down wages, end of quote. That used to be a position that both Democrats and Republicans held. What happened to that? Was Barbara Jordan a racist? Is Coretta Scott King a racist? Give me a break. As Harry Reid once said, no sane country would tolerate birthright citizenship, where an illegal alien can come to this country, have a child, and that child be automatically considered to be an American citizen. The problem with Donald Trump's threat to impose tariffs, as far as Democrats are concerned, is that it looks like it might very well have succeeded. Now the problem becomes, how do I deny President Trump credit for doing something about illegal immigration in our southern border? Now California. California is poised to become the first state in the union to allow health benefits for illegal aliens. I'm not kidding. The new governor wants to provide illegal alien benefits for those aged 19 to 25, roughly 100,000 illegal aliens, and it will cost California taxpayers roughly $100 million every single year. Look at this. As you can see, older, quote, undocumented, close quote, will not get benefits, at least not yet. Believe me, there was a proposal for all illegal aliens to get benefits, but even the new governor felt that there wasn't enough money. Well, it's happening again. People who should know better are pointing to California's current budget surplus as proof that the state, the world's fifth largest economy, is in sound financial shape. That figure is also being used to support the claim that California's relatively high tax burden and onerous regulations are not too problematic. The truth is, there is no revenue surplus had by the California state government. In fact, the state's long-run obligations far exceed projected revenue collections to the tune of $1 trillion in unfunded pension liabilities alone. When factoring in the cost of non-pension benefits for state workers, such as health care for retired government employees, the debt facing California taxpayers rises further. Well, as you can see, not every illegal alien in California is going to get health care benefits, but it's not for lack of trying. Believe me, the Democrat lawmakers in California would love to give benefits, health care benefits, to every illegal alien in this country. Why do they believe they can do that? They believe that California is running a budget surplus. Check out this article from the San Francisco Chronicle. Good news for Governor-elect Gavin Newsom. California's budget is in remarkably good shape according to a forecast for the coming fiscal year by the nonpartisan Legislative Analyst's Office." Close quote. Oh, really? So when both Democrats and Republicans put together a commission called the Little Hoover Commission to analyze the state's finances, and they found that California's pensions are dramatically underfunded, almost to the tune of a trillion dollars, they were wrong? Look, under normal, acceptable accounting principles, California would be close to being bankrupt. It is ridiculous to say that our finances are in good shape. They are not. Never mind the 
lack of morality by providing an incentive for illegal aliens to come to California, we don't have the money. How bad are California's finances? Now understand this is a state without a single Republican who's been elected statewide, not one. Not governor, not lieutenant governor, not a state secretary of state, not attorney general, not controller, nothing statewide. In fact, Democrats enjoy not a majority in the state assembly and the state senate, they enjoy super majorities to the point where in 2009, the California Democrat state treasurer, John Lockyer, warned his fellow Democrats, knock off the spending. We can't afford it. Knock it off. Here's what he said. This is the culture. But I'm sorry, two thirds of the bills that I see come out of the assembly, if they never saw the light of day, God bless it. And uh, there's too much. It's almost a courtesy that you're expected to move the junk along because I'm working with the groups and we're going to work this out in the next whatever. Mm -hmm. Just stop it. Just stop it. And just stop it. I mean, they're junk, and they're consuming all your t staff time with junk. So I, it's not a rule, it's cultural. Just Nancy Reagan's right, just say no. You can't, I, it's impossible for this legislature to reform the pension system, and if we don't, we bankrupt the state. And I don't think anybody can do it here because of who elected you. You're just captive of the current okay. environment. I don't see any way out. To By me, the way, Democrats have to call other Democrats I, on I, that, I'm hearing that. Yeah. that I'm I mean, that's, that. that's, two, be, that's two thirds of the problem. No, no, absolutely. Well, it's almost two thirds of the legislature. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. And three fourths of the bills. And people like you that should be t doing the oversight so that we manage smartly aren't you aren't and particularly I would say to the Democrats in an era when we aren't going to have tax increases give it up figure out how to be more efficient about spending the money we've got and the Republicans can help you do that if they'll get off the philosophical cant about stuff and help you make things more efficient they actually culturally no more uh, and occupationally no more about efficiencies than Democrats typically do. Finally, I've been speaking to you about my book, A Lot Like Me. It's about my not having spoken to my father for almost 10 years until I was 25 years old. We sat down and had a conversation I thought would last maybe five or 10 minutes. It ended up lasting for eight hours. A Lot Like Me, check it out. And the reason I wrote it is because of the lack of fathers in the lives of so many children. 40% of Americans are now born without a father in the house. 40%, 40%. Think about that. In 1965, 25% of black kids were born outside of wedlock, roughly around 8% of white kids were. Now 25% of white kids are born outside of wedlock and something like 70% of black kids are. Take a city like Richmond. A few years ago, there was an article, CBS article, about the large number of single parent households in that city. 60% of the households were single parent households. However, among black households in Richmond, 85% of the households were headed up by a single parent. This is the number one social problem in America. Not reparations, not inequality, not climate change, the growing number of children raised in this country without fathers. I'm Larry Elder, and this has been The Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>